welcome back to another episode of Card Talk, a podcast where we spend just a little bit of time talking about the revised core set. I'm your host, Dave Walsh. And I am the blog builder, Matt Kell. <laughs> you always have something new for me, Matt. That's good. So um, just so everybody knows, we normally have a one card, one show format here, but uh, February is our extravaganza month where we spend a little, a little bit of time going away from that format to bring you more in-depth, um, more dedicated content and we put it out all the time it's like we're spamming the community here with with good stuff so we've done sylvan's one one february couples we did superlatives whatever um but you know the revised corset was just released and we thought it would be a great time to welcome new players in talk more detailed about some of the things that new players need to know about things that need to, to happen but we're also going to use this as kind of a, hey, support us and tell you some more ways to to uh, to do that if you wish. Um, the first thing that we do, we kind of have our flagship YouTube channel. That's where it all kind of began. Uh, so if you could, um, if you could subscribe, let's see, subscribe and hit the notification bell. You know, make your comments over there on the YouTube channel. Feel free to. That would be great. We have a audio side, obviously. It's a podcast, so we need to, we should do, probably do that too. Mm -hmm. um, so in your podcatcher, whichever one you use, if you could subscribe and, and, and rate us and review us, that helps push um, our show further up the line just to, so that people, when they're searching for content for Lord of the Rings, they find us there. That would be great. Um, and we have our, blog builder is that what you called yourself <laughs> yes that is correct <laughs> so matt tell, tell us a little bit about the blog you can find the website down there but go ahead what's what is the, what's the deal with the blog ah uh, so over at the blog we are also reviewing lord of the rings one card at a time as i write an article each week to come out with the podcast where we review the same card in uh cases like uh, this February, where the blog is diverting from that, I will usually try to dive back into the Card Talk archives and play catch up with uh, card reviews related. I believe for New Player February, I've been reviewing uh, core set cards that the pod has already reviewed. Yeah. And Matt, you've been doing yeoman's work over there. You, you, uh, yeah, I bet you didn't know what you were signing on for when you when you did this, and now all of a sudden you're writing 17 articles a month, and it's like, wait, what? What am I doing? <laughs> um, Fortunately, some of those 17 are much shorter than others. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it a little easier, but uh, don't worry, we're going to go back to the normal the normal format soon. Um, but the last thing that you could do out there, if you want to really support us, you could join us on Patreon, uh, give a little. Uh, monetary donation to us every month helps us support hosting fees for the blog helps us keep the lights on at the pod um, and then anything above and beyond that we give back to the community by giving out swag to all our patrons we give out big swag to patrons who donate at the five dollar level a month and up and then we give a little something out to everybody um, no matter where you are and you know what you donate we uh, we try to thank everybody in that way so whew, that's a that's a long intro to try to get at what we're going to talk about and this is kind of our second episode in deck building here and so you know the last the last episode we kind of took the basics and we said here's what you kind of need to consider here we're going to go into a little bit more detail uh, maybe some advanced concerns uh, i say advanced concerns uh, you know concerns specifically around the core set more advanced considerations you know, with the limited card pool that is given to us in the revised core set. So, I, Matt, I don't know. Can I get... <laughs> is there <laughs> really advanced concerns when you're dealing with the core set, the revised core set? <laughs> oh, I think so, because, you know, you know, we talked about general mix and everything else and need for matching spheres and all that. But, you know, at some point you got to think about, like, what is my deck ultimately going to do here? 
Hmm. Like, you know, you've got the three basic things that are represented by the stats. You get questing, attacking, and defending. But you need your, depending on how you're playing the game, it determines how you plan to do all three of those things. Or if you're playing multiplayer, you may be able to, you know, specialize in right. one of those three. So let me let me ask this question, Matt. I don't know if we've ever talked about this. Um, what is, and I'll say that your opinion, because other people have other opinions, but what, out of questing, defending, and attacking, which one is the most important of those three, do you think? I almost hate to say it, but it's got to be questing. Okay. Why? So, why is that? Well, you know, the base level questing is the way you're how you're going to progress through the scenario. You know, you sh- there's very few quests where you only have one quest stage, but in you know, like ninety percent of the quests or whatever, you got to put progress on those quest cards in order to win the game. Uh, there may be a few scenarios where ultimately you don't have to quest. You have to really have to beat the boss enemies or whatever to get to complete the quest stages right but you know it's a, just a fundamental part of this game you gotta get that progress on there and if you don't you're taking on threat that pushes you up towards 50 and you're going to lose right and so you got the win condition and a loss condition directly tied to that one phase right there <laughs> i can see that i would i would argue that probably in how do I want to say this? Because I agree with what you're saying. Like, in, in a whole, you need to be able to quest, or else you're never going to get anywhere. But I think the most important thing to have, maybe right out of the gate, is defending. You need to have a defender on the board. Ted, Ted, and I talk about this all the time on the on the pod. But like, if you can't defend attacks from the beginning then it doesn't matter if you can make you're going to lose your heroes right it doesn't like you can you can take a round of you know increased threat just to defend something so that you can hopefully kill it but if you aren't defending or don't have a have a cure for defending right out of the bat i think that that's going to be a a problem for a lot of players. And so, you know, when you think about the core set, you know, you think, who are my defenders? You think things maybe with high defense, but more likely because of the core set, you're thinking things with, you know, a little bit of defense and a lot of hit points. So you're thinking like Gimli because of his ability and then Aragorn and of course Denethor. So, you know, like each sphere has some sort of, defender except for maybe spirit but you know i don't think <laughs> done here aon it's very good defenders but uh oh uh, you have eleanor she does have two defense and i think four hit points oh now you're gonna make me look it up but uh so that's so I get I get what you're saying, but I'm going to politely disagree in saying at the beginning, if you're not defending, you're probably going to lose the game. Overall, I think as a general rule throughout the whole life of your game that you're playing at that moment, probably questing is important. But I don't know. That's just how I was. That's how I was raised. <laughs> Well, so I also consider is you have the engagement costs too. So, you know, starting low enough threat, you could potentially not have to fight anything for a turn or two to get your defense plan in place. I agree yeah. with you. Defense is really important, but there are other <laughs> ways. That's why I kind of hate to say that questing is most important, but I think like you do you know, too, as we, you were saying too, like for the game overall, questing is one of those things that if you can't get it figured out, you're ultimately going to lose as well. Right. I think attacking is clearly the one that's like third in priority. Right. And not to say that that's not important, but you can have, if you can defend things, you can keep it engaged with you and not be worried about it too much, you know? Yeah. And so 
you know, attacking while a lot of fun is maybe like the third most important thing and maybe even lower on the list. Like if you think about all the different things that you can do in a, in a deck, you know, attacking may not even, you know, you may, you may put card draw above attacking, you know, because you want to get there. So and I've definitely played through some scenarios where the game plan was basically engage everything, keep it engaged and just quest through. And that you can, can happen even in the even in the mm-hmm. core set with at least passage through Mirkwood. You can, I don't think you can yeah. do it in Journey Along the Anduin because you have to defeat the Hill Troll to advance to stage two, and then stage and then uh, attack on Dolgodur. That's the one that I'm least familiar with, although I have played it a bunch of times. Um, well, with Escape from Dolgodur, you could end up with one of the three starting objectives guarded by an enemy and you'll have to kill the enemy to free it. That's yes. Right. I was, I was deciding in my head. I, I think you can outrun the Nazgul of Dolgador. I don't think you have to kill the Nazgul of Dolgador to beat that scenario. I, I think it has to be out of play, but I think there's another way to get out of play besides killing it. If I recall, but mm. I'm a little fuzzy on that. <laughs> People are probably screaming at us. Go right. Ahead. I can't Go ahead, tell us in the things. comments, Carl. <laughs> Carl. Carl will tell us. Um, <laughs> hey, Carl. But this leads into a bigger thing about deck building. We alluded to it in a in our previous episode about deck building versus a scenario versus deck building versus it. Uh, it's on your own deck building, putting a deck together because you just want to see how it works. And so I will say that when you're deck build, I hardly ever build against a scenario. And so like to build against a scenario, you have to see the card, the encounter cards and the quest cards. You have to know what's going on, what the mechanic is. Um, so like, for example, the hill troll, we spoiled this last time. If, if this is the first time you're playing the game and you're using this as your primer, this is a spoiler. Um, but, you know, the hill troll is has a 30 engagement cost. So, you know, the, the way to build against that is to just have your deck have lower threat than the, the hill troll. And then you can build up your board state so that you can kill the hill troll. And so that's how you build against the scenario. And then how you do that can still change, but that's that's what we mean about building against the scenario. You know, I don't think you need to necessarily do that with the other two scenarios. You do have to keep some things in mind. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna kill um, if you're gonna kill the Nazgul from Dolador, you need to be able to attack for a bunch. But you can do that in a lot of different ways. You could do that with what we call a swarm, get a whole bunch of allies on the board and be able to attack with t- 10 allies and, and kill the thing that way or 10 characters. You know, you could do it with a with a with a hero like Hero Gimli with two Citadel plates and just take one swing at him and, and kill him that way. You know, like there's a lot of different ways that you can, you know, build. But I, I don't I don't usually say, OK. Here's the scenario I'm playing. I'm going to build a deck that beats this scenario. So Matt, how do you, when you are building a deck, what are you, what are you doing? Cause you, I mean, to, to, just to plug the blog, if you go over to the blog, Matt's been playing through a whole bunch of stuff and he reports what he's doing. You know, sometimes he net decks, he goes, finds uh, decks that have been built by other people. You go to rings DB. It's a great resource of, of decks that have been built, you know, but then, you know, I don't know. So Matt, Matt, like, does this. He does it at least once or twice a week and reports it on the Card Talk blog. So, anyways, so Matt, all that to say, I know I buried the lead there, but <laughs> what do you, how do you do that? Uh, so, typically, I start with a deck I want to build for myself or something I want to play to go back to the net deckings. I, I have gone through rings db extensively at various points it saved a lot of decks so i'm like oh that looks cool oh that looks interesting um so i'll usually start with those probably lose uh the first attempt at a scenario and then i'll 
then the Boromir player will come out and be like, okay, we want to get the win on this scenario. What worked? What didn't work? Do I need to tweak this deck or can I, or do I need to build a fresh deck to take this scenario on? Um, so it just kind of depends, but usually I end up building against the scenario because I have not played every quest quite yet. And so I'm doing the whole thing of like, I play the next quest in the sequence and once I get my win, I move on. <laughs> so I play a, not a progression style, but I am progressing through the content. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think in there, you said something that I probably do is I like, I'll build a deck that I want to build. I'll find some interesting cards that go together and then I'll say, Oh, you know, and then I'll play it and then I'll be like, Oh, I better change out these cards because, you know, like, you know, as I deck test or just play and then I'm like, Oh, I better add some threat reduction to it. You know, like I, I kind of tweak it as I test my deck out against certain scenarios. And that's always kind of the way it works out for me. Um, are you just tweaking though to refine the deck or are you tweaking it to the scenario that you're currently playing? Well, that, that's, a, that's a good question because it's hard to know, right? Because if I'm playing a scenario and I'm like, oh, I didn't need, you know, these, the, this steward of Gondor because I'm playing, you know, passage through Mirkwood, <laughs> you know, and then the next scenario, I'm like, oh, you know, like, so I'm tweaking based on the play, but that play may be based on this, you know, it may be that I'm tweaking because of the scenario, not just because I have dead cards in my hand, you know, like it's, so it's all interrelated at that point because the scenario is. Uh, I was just curious since, uh. I've been playing, or I had been playing Land of Sorrow before I went to the core campaign, and that one you raise your threat a lot. And threat reduction is one of those things I don't normally put in a deck unless I have trouble with threat. Right. Or at least I don't put a lot of threat reduction in a deck. I might put like, you know, Galadrim's Greeting, a couple copies in just to be on the safe side. But I won't be like, oh, I need, you know, a full play set of Galadrim's Greeting and uh, the play set of Elrond's Council for this, unless I really am running into trouble. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things to <laughs> consider with some of those later scenarios. Oh, right. Well, exactly. back to the core set though. Like, so right. I think, um, I think it. This is a good time to talk about. You know, you, you were talking about the importance of questing, and so I think, you know, when you think about building a deck and needing questing, what are some of the cards that you're going to include that are really, you know, helping out for questing? Like, where where are we going with questing? So generally with in questing, you know, we're going to be looking at willpower stats to start. You know, if you're playing Spirit, you're probably going to be putting Eowyn. She's the primary quester. If you're not playing Spirit, then, you know, you're looking at the other heroes are pretty much at two willpower. So you're going to need a couple of them at least early on to quest. And then you're more important that you're getting allies out to help them do that and ramp that up so that you can consistently stay ahead of the encounter deck because you know we have necromancer's pass that has a really nasty travel effect in enchanted stream so you're not going to want to travel to every location and sometimes you have things like dolgodor beastmaster that has three attack that's like uh i'd rather not engage that right away and reveal two shadow cards so <laughs> it's 35 engagement cost it can stay up there for a little while <laughs> yeah i mean there's got to be some some deck out there. I'm sure it's been created because it's from the core set, but that's like Eowyn and, and Aragorn and, you know, Eleanor, I guess. I don't know. Like, this, that's leadership spirit, which is really good because you end up having, you know, the ability to get Northern Tracker and you can put Calabrian Stone on Aragorn so that you can have... Nor, you know, your northern tracker out in a couple of turns because I think that northern tracker is 
a really good card <laughs> for some of these uh, corset scenarios. Um, you know, like it's just you get the the brown lands, right? The brown lands or the east bite. Which one is the one that's six and one? Uh, it's brown lands. That's five threat and one quest point. Right. So you know, to be able to get rid of that card without actually traveling to it is phenomenal so you know like there's some pretty good cards in that leadership spirit combination that really get you through questing um pretty good not to mention sneak attack gandalf steward of gondor unexpected courage those cards that are kind of staples in the game. Gandalf, of course, is neutral, but, you know, like... Well, you also have leadership of, Faramir, that if you got a good right. ally swarm going, he just basically adds one for every questing character you've got. Right. And you can get silly with it, with things like Ever Vigilant, where it's like, here, let's give them all plus two willpower. <laughs> right, because and that's one of those things. You can trigger that. If you can ready Faramir you can trigger his action as many times as you can ready him. Right. And that's good. Or you can send him to the quest, ready him, and then use his, his action. Ability. Yeah. Which most of the time it's better to just trigger his ability twice or three times or four, whatever it is. But it seems like that's where you want to go when you're dealing with questing, right? Like those are the, that's... Right, you need to get either allies on the board or get some willpower boosting out. Right. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to sidetrack the conversation a little bit because I think now is the time to talk about it or else we'll never get to it is that I think that um, there is definitely a difference between building a, a, a solo deck, a deck designed for me to play all by myself and playing multiplayer. And I think that that's, important to talk about right now. So when I, and one of the reasons why I add flavor to the show is because I play 90% of my games, I play solo. So when I'm building a solo deck, all those things that Matt and I were talking about at the beginning of the show, you know, I have to be able to do all by myself. I need to be able to, I'll put defense first. I'll be able to defend and quest and attack all by my lonesome. So my deck better be able to do that. But when you're playing multiplayer, like now, and Matt, you mentioned it a little while ago, is you can specialize and then you can have a deck that maybe is a combination, you know, like I'm going to have the questing deck, you know, and so I'll have that Eowyn, Eleanor, Aragorn deck that's just designed to quest crazy with Faramir and you know like whatever you know or and I'll you know favor the lady and you know all those Calabrian stone like that's what my deck is going to do and then then you'll have another deck a tactics deck maybe that is you know tactics and lore that's just responsible for combat phase you know so the beauty of playing multiplayer even though I'm primarily a solo player the beauty of playing multiplayer is not lost on me where you can create a fellowship where decks can then become a little more specialized and you don't have to do everything all at once. Right. And kind of key to that are the uh, sentinel and range keywords. Because uh, like your example there, if you have someone that has a questing deck and you're running the combat deck, um, you know, you can engage, actually engage one enemy a turn, but still then any other additional enemies still have to fall normally. So, you know, playing two player, you might be able to take both enemies that come out to yourself, but if you get a surging enemy or if you're playing more than two players, um, you can't control that engagement as easily unless you're running like Son of Arnor or something, but even then... <laughs> Could be a little tricky. So can be. Uh, that's where the sentinel and ranged help because the sentinel will let you use that sentinel character to defend for another player. 
And then with the ranged, you can declare a ranged attacker to attack uh, an enemy engaged with another player. Right. And while there's not a ton of those cards in the core set, uh, Sentinel, you know, like the Gondorian Spearman and Aragorn, mm, you know, there's I think that. That's it. And that, you know, those are Sentinel characters, but those are important to, you know, deal with. And then ranged, uh, you know, it's Legolas and the horseback archer. And the uh, Sylvan archer or sil no it's not silver archer. silver load archer silver right. load archer yep yep and so you know like those cards are important to include in multiplayer um especially those those allies right uh, right but i'm not sure that i would ever include a silver load archer or a horseback archer in my solo deck because I don't need ranged and they're not really cost effective. I think both cost three and you know, like, yep. and so like, it's not something that I would think about Aragorn. Of course I would consider solo because Aragorn can do a lot of things. Aragorn can, and plus he has, we talked about that action advantage. That action advantage is really great. So Aragorn could, quest for two if he's got a calabrian stone he can quest for four you know and then he can ready and then he can do something else defend whatever you know so that sentinel keyword on aragorn is you know is is not useful playing solo but i would still play aragorn solo and i would play legolas solo because that three attack that legolas has and he can take you i don't know if you would want to but um you know you can defend a little something with with Legolas if you if you're super desperate one defense and four hit points, you know you can you can take the swing from a four spider or something if you're if you're desperate. So more likely know. I would just take the undefended attack with four hit points. <laughs> that, <laughs> especially against uh, the core set enemies where a lot of them have two attack. You just have to watch out for some of those shadows that have additional. Yeah, yeah. there's nasty shadow effects, right? they're undefended yeah so i mean i think that it's important to realize that you know when you're building a deck or when you're building for this game you know there, there's a little bit of a different philosophy when you're building for multiplayer versus when you're building solo you still have to do all the same things but with multiplayer you can split those things and specialize a little bit more and that's, I think, important and can be fun. You don't have to by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that, you know, I think that the that the nature of the game is that that you want to be able to play instead of playing, you know, three different solo players just playing their deck. It's more fun if you can build build decks that interact with each other and you know help each other out at the very least with sentinel and ranged stuff, and that's and that's fun too. Well, you could also play attachments on other players and things like that, too. So, you know, if someone's got a combat heavy deck with, you know, Gimli, Legolas, and I guess Thalon, since he's the other corset <laughs> hero, um, you know, they're just pure tactics. They just want to attack things and do damage. You know, the spirit lore player across from them can still do things like give you know legless unexpected courage to help them attack things or uh you know protector of lorian to boost gimli's defense just in case you know he gets a really bad shadow and he's already damaged it's like all right well here you can discard a few cards and save him or throw a uh, self-preservation on Gimli for the same reason just like yeah i love the love the attack bonus but too much damage and <laughs> he's a goner right even even including some specific like if if you're playing tactics but have the other spirit hero and then you have the the spirit lore deck that you're talking about even including um cards that you can play across the table in sphere are good right like you know there's no reason or, or maybe you have a core set and somebody else has a core set you know like there's no reason why you shouldn't include 
you know, six copies of Test of Will if you're playing. <laughs> There's no such thing as too many Test of Wills. Let's let's get that out there right now. You know, so those are those are things to also keep in mind. You know that uh, you know that overlapping spheres is not a bad thing when you're playing multiplayer because again you can do lots of fun things by doing that oh and also you can you know say say we have two pretty combat heavy decks one might be you know really wishing they had a light of gondolin or something for legolas and you know you drew one but you're not running legolas you got gimli it's like yeah okay Gimli's got his own attack boosting. I don't need this Blade of Gondolin, so I'll play it over here on the Legolas player who really needs it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think... <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not, Matt, but uh, you know what Ted says the biggest weakness of any card is, right? <laughs> you have to draw it first. You have to draw it first. And I think that one of the things that that new players, especially players that aren't familiar with card games, I think if you're coming to this game from other card games, Magic, Arkham, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, L5R, whatever, whatever card game, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever it is, you know, I think that you understand the importance of having your tools available to you. So, you know, I think one of the things that you want to be able to do is to card draw and lore really with the exception of valiant sacrifice i know it's out there <laughs> but you know like i think lore when you're playing like you should be playing lore out of the revised core set <laughs> like in almost any deck that you have just because you want the card draw i think that there is uh Barivor draw two glaywine draw one is it lorian's wealth draw three for three and then gandalf draw three yep and then even though that's not lore but and then i is gandalf search in the core set Yes, Gandalf searches in the core set. Oh, is that all of them? That's all that I found. Oh, yes. Oh, that's not any sort of thing. But the, I guess the point about talking about card draw, though, Matt, is that it's, you know, I think that it's important that you have card draw. And I used to undervalue card draw, but probably the worst part about that can happen to you is what they call top decking, right? Is when you're drawing just one card every turn from the top of your deck and you're not getting the cards you want and you're just so frustrated because you're not getting to that steward, you're not getting to the, you know, the the sneak attack, Bayorn, you know, you're not getting to the whatever thing you need to get to. And so right. it may be worth playing lore regardless if you're solo or multiplayer because you want a card draw and a lot of times those card draw effects can be passed to other people right so just talk, going to the cards you were talking about gandalf search lorian's wealth glanwine bearvor they can all be targeted on other players yeah, so I mean, talk about a good support deck, right? <laughs> Is <laughs> I'm gonna have you draw some cards, Matt. Great, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, yep, everyone loves to draw cards and have more options available. It's it's one of the greatest multiplayer support plays, especially when someone's just sitting there like, oh, I've got nothing for this planet. It's like, okay, then draw a card. Right. I'm like, oh, you're right. Let's see if I can play something. Exactly. <laughs> it's I mean, it's it's really good. And you need the resources to play those cards, but you have to be able to draw you have to have the cards in order to play them. So, you know, and going back to what we said last episode about 
cost curves and, you know, things like that. Like that's all part of the, the deal. Um, I think the last thing that I want to talk about, um, in, in, in this like deck building, I don't want to call it advanced deck building, but you know, like deck building, you know, whatever the next step is. So I want to talk about combos and I want to talk about combos um, and I want to talk about something that was meaningful to me when I was learning how to deck build for this game particularly is that the best combos are the combos that can be used separately. So, you know, we've gone through and, you know, we're releasing core combos as part of this, you know, thing and we have these combos. But I think one of the reasons why Sneak Attack Gandalf is so powerful is because Gandalf can be played separately without sneak attack. And that's a good play no matter what. Sneak attack does not have to be used to put Gandalf into play. There's there's loads of other allies that you can use in a pinch if you need to that's not Gandalf. And so what makes that sneak attack Gandalf combo so good is that each of those cards can be used separately to do good in the game. And if you are, hold on one second. Uh, if you are building a deck and you need to do five things in a row in this game to get your card out, you're probably not going to be able to do it. And so I think that that's what, you know, as, as we kind of wrap up this, this episode, I think that, you know, the best combos are the ones that each part of it is a good card in and of itself. Now there's not a ton of that in the, in the core set, but if you're thinking about, you know, playing sneak attack to get the son of Arnor out so that you can play the, the forest snare because you don't have en enough resources in the leaderships, you know, like it's just too many parts and each of those cards may not be good. If the only reason why you're playing son of Arnor is so you can engage the hill troll so that you can put forest snare on it. Like, I don't know, that may not be a good, a good combo because each of those parts aren't necessarily really good. Now, Forest Snare, Son of Arnor is, is reasonable to play, but you have to make sure that those cards are fitting into your deck also separately. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at here? Can you add to what I'm trying to say? <laughs> oh, I think so. It's just so you, you don't want to pigeon your whole your combo cards into one particular use case right it's kind of what you're getting at like if you're going to run son of arnor there's got to be more reasons to include it than just i'm going to use it to get the hill troll and you know the course set there's some other opportunities for that it's, uh the goblin snipers and journey along the anduin i actually watched uh grant play with uh wandering took and big fomo last night where they ran into two goblin snipers they couldn't engage up in the stage area and i was listening to them in their chat like did you guys play son of ardor and a bunch of other stuff but it's like you know the son of ardor can be good in this scenario without sneak attack or even without forest snare but you know this those are things you gotta think about is the combo in of itself sometimes can be a lot of fun but if you only have one use case for it then maybe it's not the combo you need. And so there you have it, folks. Matt takes after all the other hosts that I've had on and says something that I was trying to say over five minutes. He says it in 30 seconds, way better than what I was trying to do. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, Matt, if you're not careful, you're going to end up being a uh, regular host of the pod here. This is, it's going to it's going to be uh, bad news. Yeah, that poor blog won't have to won't have a staff writer anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
won't have a web blog master dude guy. <laughs> um, so, Matt, I'll I'll let you have last gasp here, and then I'll I'll say whatever it is. But uh, you know what? What's your you know as we as you think about deck building in the core set? You know what? What's what? What's your you know final thoughts for the for the community here? Uh, you know, we we got only briefly touched on the combos because we're also doing the core combos series. But you know, as limiting as the core set and revised core set is, it still has a lot of cards, and they do do a pretty good job of interacting with each other. You're not gonna get the most thematic decks, but there's a lot you can do to combine things and think about and be like, okay, I could try doing this. You know, I can give Dune here, you know, Dwarven axes and see if I can make that stage area attack work. Or, you know, what does it take to get the Valiant Sacrifice to draw me two cards reliably? You know, there's a lot to explore just with the core set. And it's really just a matter of like, you know, you got to try some things out you know, play Passage Through Mirkwood if you just want to see if a deck can do anything. Um, you know, it's the deck building for me is the, the best part of this game. And, you know, you can net deck and things like that, but, you know, you, you can take a look at the cards, get excited about how you're going to use them. And that for me is the most fun thing. <laughs> yeah, and I will... Um... I'll piggyback off of that. And I said, I'll say that, you know, like when I started playing this, I got it strictly because I love Lord of the Rings and my friend gave me a deck to play with. And I was like, this is fun. So like, I wasn't necessarily a strong deck builder, but I will say that all jokes aside, I think I've become a better deck builder and I'm, you know, I'm not like top tier, like some of the crazy awesome deck builders that exist in the in the community but i can see how cards interact and i can and do that and so i think the that the the words of advice that i will that i will say is um that kind of echo what matt was saying is you know play the game explore have fun and you know don't be afraid to like tweak and change and and do stuff because that's what the game is supposed to be it's supposed to be you playing around in kind of the sandbox of middle earth and that's i mean what what better theme is there than you know than than middle earth so you know have fun with putting stuff together and who knows maybe you'll find something that uh you know that that just really tickles your fancy and that's and that's what you're looking for is that those things that you just really love so so i guess that wraps up our uh two part series in deck building and just so you know there's a ton of other considerations uh in in deck building to to worry about a lot of subtleties you know things to things to worry about especially as the card pool grows but you know i mean you could we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about you know just a couple of different things so you know we'll leave it there and so or you know, maybe have spent hours and hours talking about those things <laughs> <laughs> 100% Matt it's almost like you do that I mean that's what that's what our show is right is is inspiration for deck building is you know that's that's the that's the true nature of what card talk was supposed to be is here's a card here's what it does here's you know let's talk about it and then hopefully when you hear the show you get inspiration to build a deck around that card and you're like oh this is this is cool and you know i'll say something that somebody hasn't thought about or ted will say something grant will say something you'll write about stuff that none of us have ever thought about so you know like so that's the that's the thing you know like wherever you draw your inspiration is cool but but do it have fun and you know have a, have a great time doing it and playing middle earth so with that, I think it's important to end the show. So <laughs> I can only beat a dead horse so much here about deck building. So anyways, 
<laughs> Everybody, <laughs> we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Do you love the content? Here's what you can do to stay connected. Become a patron. The money collected through Patreon goes into keeping the lights on here at the podcast. We love our patrons, and you can join at many different levels. Visit patreon.com slash cardtalk2018. You can subscribe to us, whether you're watching our YouTube channel or you're listening to us in your favorite podcatcher. Hit the subscribe button to get notifications of all our new episodes. Didn't know we were an audio podcast? Find us by searching Card Talk to get access to our 120 plus regular episodes. Didn't know we were a video channel? Find us by searching Card Talk L O T R L C G on YouTube. And there you can find not only our regular episodes, but you can find our bonus playthroughs and other content related to the game. Want to get a hold of Ted, Grant, or myself? Feel free to email the podcast at cardtalk2018 at gmail.com.